All right. In this video, I want to continue what I was talking about in the last video. I had to do its Catholic works for salvation, where I was talking about inheriting the kingdom of heaven and how that is not synonymous with salvation. And it's not synonymous with justification. It's obviously connected, but it's not synonymous. It's not the same thing. And what I would like to do to start this is warn you that there might be a lot of notifications going off because I was talking to another Catholic fella about Mary. And I brought up a verse how she consummated the marriage with Joseph after Jesus was born and that Jesus had brothers it was like four of them, Simon, Joseph, Judas, and I can't remember the fourth one, but he had brothers, and it says that he has sisters. So Mary was not a virgin after Jesus was born. Uh, she had sexual relations with Joseph because they were married. That's how it works. You know, you're not married unless you consummate the marriage. So anyway, that's a bit of a side subject there. Uh, but he seemed to get a little bit upset. And I'm going to bring up one thing here about what he said because it ties into what I want to start off here, which is this right here in Romans chapter 11. Now, there's a big connection between ancient Israel and the Roman Catholic Church. And I can see it as the same things happening, you know, history repeating itself, right? You know, you got the high priest of Israel, and then you got the Pope of Catholicism, right? You got both falling into apostasy and falling into works of the law, and basically not recognizing Jesus right in front of their face and denying him. And they both offer up their sacrifices daily. The Jews would offer up literal animal sacrifices at the temple while the Catholics daily claim that they turn literal uh, Jesus into the wafers and the wine that they actually consume at the services. And that's supposed to be the sacrifice for their sins. And they do this daily. But just like the sacrifices Israel did didn't take away their sins, neither does taking part of the Eucharist take away your sins. They both point to Jesus. The sacrifice of animals pointed to Jesus in the future, and the, sac uh, the Eucharist points to what Jesus did for us in the past. They both point at Jesus, all right? And you could go m more deeply into how uh, Roman Catholicism is just like ancient Israel. You know, both think they are saved because they're part of the one true church, and that God will never forsake them, never divorce them and yada 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 yet they contradict this because they say they they are saved by their works so if their works don't matter uh you know add up then you know they're divorced you know they're cut off as we get into right here in romans chapter 11 i know you might have paused this and read this already that'd be cool but in romans chapter 11 and verse 20 it talks about israel being cut off from the tree, the tree representing basically the church, the body of Christ, and they're part of it, right? Because Jesus is the root, and he bears up the tree, and everybody's different branches, right? But it says here about Israel that they were broken off, right? And it says, well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and now standest by faith, right? Right? So we're grafted in by faith. And you know how they were broken off by unbelief. You, you see here that they were broken off not because of their works, and their works didn't add up, and you're not grafted in because of your works and your works adding up. That's not how it works, you see, because the publicans and the harlots and the sinners all had faith. They are grafted in. These Pharisees who were keeping the works of the law, they were doing the works, Yet they were broken off because of unbelief, right? Uh, so we see here, 
even with this, salvation is by faith, not by works. All right? It does talk about being broken off, but you're broken off because of unbelief, not faith. That's something I can get into later, and I have gotten into a bit in other videos that talk about uh, once saved, always saved, and faith versus works, and saved by faith, and such things like that. Uh, but anyway, what I want to focus on here is how this pertains to Catholicism and my last video here. So, with that being said, I want to get onto this, and then a lot of this is about the inheriting the kingdom. But this is something I had to bring up here. In Matthew chapter 6, at verse 1, I'm going to read the first uh, four verses here. It says, Take heed that ye do not your alms, and the alms are like your good works, your charity, and other such things, as we can see here, you know, mercy, pity. Uh, specifically, it says alms, and you know, it's doing your good deeds, right? It says, he that you do not do your alms before men, to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. See, if you're doing that to get the praise of men, that's your reward. You got your reward. Good for you. Give you a hand. You did a good thing. You're a good man. Let's give you a clap. All right, there's your reward. Hope you enjoy. It says, But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thy alms may be in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. You see, this is how it's difficult to judge somebody. Because we can't judge the heart. Because you can have two people, like I said in the other video, work at a soup kitchen. One does it, it's not even work, because they actually love everybody. They love God, they love everybody. They just do it because they're full of love. They may get a little worn out and they need rest and whatnot, but for the most part, they're joyously doing what they're doing. While somebody else who's working at soup kitchen doing all this stuff, they're doing it to get people to think highly of them and that they're a good person. Uh, they do it to earn their salvation. They do it to prove they are saved. You know, they do it to try to show, look at my love for God, look at my love for my fellow man. It, it's more of a love for themselves, it's selfishness. And it's hard to really judge someone's heart, right? God does that. We can only judge the outward fruit and we can say, yay, give them a clap for the good they've done. But we don't know their intention. God does, right? If we really get to know somebody, we could probably learn their intention. But just meeting people out while they're doing something, you know, you, it's best to think the best of them, right? That they're doing it for the right reasons and whatnot. Because even Satan himself can do a good deed. That doesn't make him save, now does it? Of course not. Because you're not saved by your works. Because anybody can do something good. So anyway, uh, that's this is what I wanted to bring about. I know there's another passage in the Bible. But this is talking about, you know, works. The whole part of Matthew chapter 5 through 7 is the law, right? It's expounding the law, such as uh, Jesus is sitting here on the Mount of Olives, right? And at Mount Sinai on the Mount was given the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law that goes with it through Exodus chapter 20 through 24, right? So this is just a humbled version of what happened at Mount Sinai. And if you're going to work, uh, earn your salvation, right, this is what you would have to do. Because this is talking to Israel, to the Jews. And this is something, again, that would have to be done during the time of Jacob's trouble, or also known as the tribulation. You would have to work out your salvation. Right? So when it says to do your good works in front of men, that God may be glorified, uh, that is talking to Christians. Because you're under the period of grace, right? And you're trying to get people saved. So you're going to be doing those good things, get people's attention towards God, right? During this period, you can't just go and do something good and get people saved because 
you you tell them to have faith in Jesus, they're going to have to actually do the work. And that's why you have to rightly divide the word of God, because you have a covenant given with Abraham, right? And uh, it, it didn't have conditions. It was just by Abraham's faith, right? But then there's a covenant given at Mount Sinai, which has conditions, right? But all of that was to point to Jesus, because Jesus is the only one that can actually fulfill it. And then when he fulfills it, you can come by faith and be part of the Abrahamic covenant where there's no condition. You just got to have faith that you're part of it, right? But then there's a part where God takes his grace away. And you're going to have to do the works. That's why you can see both in the Bible. You need to rightly divide. You need to get in the word and really study. And nowhere does it say we are saved by our works. It does condone doing good works, and no one says not to do good works. But you're not saved by them. And like here, you want to be rewarded by God, right? Then don't do them openly, because you get your reward from men, and men aren't going to reward you with salvation. And this is repeated here a few times here. It says, Thy Father which seeth in secret shall re reward thee openly, right? It doesn't say when he'll reward you, right? And then again down here. I highlight this so that I would be able to point it out real fast. I don't know if it says it a couple more times here, but it, it I know it says it at least those three times, which is really establishing it, right? Do what you're doing in secret. Now don't try to get all the praise of men and whatnot. But anyway, let's get into these next few ones here. I'm going to try to go through quick. They all talk about inheriting the kingdom of heaven. And I just want to go over real quick to show it's connecting to justification and salvation, if there's any whatsoever, right? Actually, I do not recall going over this one. So we can start with this one. And this is just winging it because who knows, maybe this one will rebuke me at 718. It says here, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possession, the, the kingdom forever and ever and ever, even forever and ever. My bad. Um, let's look at the context here. Because it talks about the four beasts which shall arise. Uh, I don't get the context of it other than it says the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. Right? It seems to be basically just telling you amongst all the stuff that's going on with these beasts that rise up. You know, the saints don't have to worry. They shall receive the, the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and it forever and ever. I guess because it's talking about how these beasts seem to have the kingdom, right? Well, we got Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Papal Rome, and then, and then it tells you, hey, don't worry about it. You know. Um, but uh, let, let's continue here. I don't see anything about saying that about justification or salvation here. All right? So we, unless we can connect it with other things talking about the kingdom, we can't really base anything off of the salvation of this text here. All right? So let's let's go into some more here. Colossians chapter 1 at verse 12 it says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, right? It goes on to say, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Okay, now check this out. This is partakers of the inheritance, right? Of the saints in light. So it's partakers of the inheritance of the saints, 
and it just says they're, the saints are going to inherit, right? So you can be partakers of this. And it says here, present tenth, here, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into his kingdom of his dear son. So we are already in it, right? And there's nothing that keeps saying you come in and you go out, you come in, you go out, right? In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So we're, it says here, redeemed by his blood and our sins are forgiven through this same blood. And that's how we are translated into this, which is amazing, right? It's not works of ourselves. It's a gift of God, right? And, uh, yeah, so we don't really see anything here about only those who do a certain work inherit, I mean, uh, are saved. It, it connects doing good works to be partakers of the inheritance or to have the inheritance. But it says here that he already has delivered us from the power of darkness and has already translated us into the kingdom through his blood, right? That's how we get the forgiveness. We're into the kingdom because of what Jesus did. Now, if we want to be partakers of the inheritance, well, there's a little bit here about saying walk that he may be worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, right? Increasing in knowledge of God. And it talks about patience and long suffering, which ties to Galatians chapter 5, which talks about the fruit of the Spirit. So this is works that God does within you. And that's something you can't even take credit for. Because if you start getting the patience and long suffering and joyfulness, you cannot produce this in yourself. Have you tried to be patient and long suffering with people and to be joyful? Just produce it yourself. It just doesn't happen. The fruit of the Spirit does, being able to see God in his true beauty and being able to be uh, able to know that you're saved, right? And that God loves you. That produces the fruit of joy and makes you want to hang out with God so that the fruit of patience and long-suffering starts to come forth as well. And that starts to come forth, you're going to be partakers of the inheritance. But there's people who are in the kingdom who are kind of uh, selfish little pricks, right? Let's just go over here real quick. I know this is about the law and doing works, but there's something really interesting here in Matthew chapter 5. It gets down here. And I think it's interesting how it calls out the Pharisees down here. It says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Now the scribes and Pharisees would be like, you know, the, the cardinals, bishops, and priests and stuff working by the law. They're doing the same thing. They're doing the works, doing all the same thing, right? And your righteousness has to exceed that. And the only way your righteousness is going to exceed that is if you put down your own righteousness and accept God's righteousness, which is Jesus. But what I really wanted to point out here is, you know, those who do the, the commandments of God, it says that they will be considered, let's see, whosoever shall break the least and shall teach men to do so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, Right? But whosoever shall do and teach them shall the same be called the great in the kingdom of heaven. So you got people in the kingdom of heaven who break these and teach others to do it. But they're in the kingdom of heaven. And we're just talking about the kingdom. They, but they're not going to have an inheritance. Right? What is those who keep them and to teach to keep them. And I'm in no way teaching you not to keep them. And I'm not teaching you to break them. I know that's the same thing. Uh, I don't encourage myself and think it's okay to not keep them. I'm just saying I'm not saved by keeping them. I'm not keeping them to prove I'm saved. I'm not prove, keeping them to be saved. 
when I do keep them, it's not by my own power. It's God just keeping me from my own selfish desires, my own sinful nature. Because I do want to break them. I do want to do my own thing. And without God, I would just be a slave to Him. So anyway, uh, where I leave off over here, Ephesians chapter 5, it says, For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So it doesn't say they're not in the kingdom. It says they have no inheritance. Right? James chapter 2. Verse 5, it says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? So you see two connections here to heirs. They're rich in faith and they love him. Nothing about their works. You know why? Because if you're rich in faith and you love God, his spirit produces fruit out of you. It doesn't come from you. You can't even take credit for it, like I've been saying. All the good that comes from me is not mine. I I just get credit from men for it, but it's not not of me. Not of me at all. Not saying that I do a lot of good. <laughs> but any good that I do do, that I do do. Okay, I'm going to stop here and move on to the next one. Yeah, I guess what I do do is do do. Yeah. But anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Is, uh, this is what is brought up a couple times that I brought up in the last video. This one in Galatians 5. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And then down here, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You notice it doesn't say they shall not enter the kingdom of God. Or that they'll be kicked out of the kingdom of God. It says they shall not inherit, which means own. That they can claim it for their own. Right? They're going to be there, but they can't claim it as their own. They're not getting kicked out, but they don't have anything there. You know, build up your treasures in heaven. Which goes back into what I started the video on. That's something I wanted to bring up. Because I was like, you know, no Catholic or Protestant really does this one. Where was it here? Treasure in heaven. Yeah, let's read this real quick. Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if you got your treasures here on earth, what do you what's precious to you? You need to give that up and build your treasure up in heaven. Uh, when I came to Christianity, I always thought it was weird how Christians build up families. I'm not saying it's wrong or evil. I just thought it was strange because some of these people were teaching about you know end of the world and all this stuff. I'm like, then why are you wasting your time going to college, uh, going to your jobs, uh, starting families, uh, worrying about your, your children and all these you know health concerns and all these stuff? Why are you getting in so hardcore into the politics? Why does any of that matter to you? It doesn't make sense. Granted, you know, I get caught up in things, but I can see that it's foolish and I have to fight my flesh. But I was figuring, you know, Christians who grew up with this, you think their spirit would be working on them. And I, it makes, it just looks weird to me. It doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, uh, Galatians, uh, basically the same thing, right? It talks about how we used to be like this, but we need to produce fruit of the spirit. You know, people who are uh, adulterers, fornicators, idolaters, hatred, full of wrath and heresies and all this stuff. You know, some of us used to be atheists, used to spit on Christians, maybe, you know, not literally, but with our words and our attitude. You know, there's Christians who are going to be like that, and they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But it doesn't say they're going to be kicked out 
or they're not going to enter. It says they're not going to inherit. Now, that's one of the things we need to really pay, pay attention to is the words that are actually used. Because the guy who brought up 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and Galatians chapter 5 said we're going to lose our justification, which is tied to losing your salvation. Because if you're not justified, you're not saved. But nowhere in uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and Galatians 5 do we see anything about losing justification. But if you take not inheriting as that, well, then you just twisted it into something that it obviously doesn't say, right? In uh, First Corinthians, we get it again in chapter 15, and it says, Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I like this, this one right here. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but... We shall all be changed in a moment and twinkle of an eye at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, which is our flesh, right? The flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, right? Must put on incorruption. So we're building up our works. What are we doing our works with? With our flesh. With our flesh and blood, we're doing these works. No, you need to walk by the Spirit. Let the Spirit do the works. You can't even take credit for those works. The works that you're trying to take credit for of the flesh, you're going to have to get rid of that. Toss it aside because you need to put on incorruption because your works can be corrupted and they're considered filthy rags to God anyway. You know, your mortal, your, your thing you're doing works with, kind of perish away, turn the dust, blow away. You need to put on immortality, all right? When this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall we brought, be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which have given us, us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the one victorious, and when we're connected to him, one flesh with him, we have victory. And it's not our victory through our works. It's God's finished work. And that's why, I mean, that's how you honor the Sabbath. You rest in God already doing the work. He already did it. Finished it from the foundation, right? Just rest in that. I'm trying to do your works. that You're breaking the Sabbath. You're doing works on the Sabbath. What do you, what's wrong with you? Right? You're breaking the law. By saying you're keeping the law. Uh, Matthew 25. Oh yeah, right here. Inherit the kingdom of God at verse 34. This has to do with some works. And I wanted to talk about this a little bit. Right? Because we need to know when this is being... Uh, when Jesus is talking about, right? Because at verse 34 it says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and he gave me meat. And it talks about the good works, right? And then he says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And it's because they did not do these good works, right? But the context is up here. It says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory... So this wasn't even necessarily at the time they were even at. And all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left hand. So this is after a, the tribulation. Because all nations are going to be gathered. When Jesus comes to gather his people, he raises up the dead and he gathers his saints. Uh, this is before the tribulation. He's not coming down to sit on the throne. That's how you know uh, when Jesus is returned is because people have been just taken. They're gone. Right? And uh, he's if he lands on earth... And he's, you know, doing all these miracles and stuff. You know that it's an antichrist, a false prophet, false messiah, a deceiver, 
Yeah, Satan himself, right? Satan in the flesh, right? And when after the tribulation, and he sits on the throne of his glory, when he's actually on earth, and all nations are brought before him, he's going to be judging people based on their works. Because our works are Jesus' works. He's given us credit for his works. Not because we deserve it either. Just because he's a great guy. That's why. He's a great God. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, just wanted to bring that up. Because uh, this is where it says the in inherit the kingdom, right? And it talks about the ones who do, they're doing good works. But at the same time, think about it this way. You don't think that there's people that, like Lucifer, his fallen angels, you know, the demons, and just people who are satanic. You don't think they're pretending by actually doing these good works? Do you think that is accredited to them for doing these things? Even though they're doing them just to deceive people, to make them think that they're Christians? Does that count? Even though they're deceiving people by doing it? I'm assuming you're going to say no, right? Because they're of their intention. They're doing it to deceive, to make people think that they're Christian when they're not. And it's exactly what I'm saying. You, when these works, you can't even take credit for. That's why, like these people are saying, when did I do these things, right? And uh, I know it's because he says he didn't, you did it to me, and they don't get it because they were like, I didn't do anything to you. But anyway, uh, uh, people can fake doing these good works. I mean, let, let's go back to the Sermon on the Mount again before we leave the, read the last little thing I got here. And down here it says something very interesting, because this is about the, uh, the law, right? Doing good works, right? And Jesus says, beware of false prophets, right? Because there's many wolves that come in sheep clothing. So there's many people who are popes, cardinals, bishops, priests, uh, and, you know, pastors among the Protestants all over the place, right? There's wolves in sheep's clothing, right? It says you know them by their fruit, right? So you think, oh, you mean their works? No, fruit of the Spirit. If somebody's full of joy and love and patience and they're very gentle and calm, that's fruit of the Spirit. That's how you know someone. But if someone doesn't have that, that's a, that's a big warning sign, right? It doesn't tell you exactly what the fruit is, but we get a taste of it here. At verse 21, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Some Catholics think that you can't even call Jesus Lord unless you know, you're know you saved, you're of the Spirit of God. So you, you, you're telling me that uh, Satan and his angels can't call Jesus Lord just to mock him? Like, oh, whatever you say, Lord. <laughs> right? You don't think... Atheists can't do that. You can't people just pretending to be Christians can't do that. It's just foolish. But he said, but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. All right. It says many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? So there's people who are prophesying in Jesus's name. All right. They actually think Jesus is doing this with them, but obviously they're being deceived. As we're going to read on, because they're, 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 they're telling the future in Jesus' name. And they say they cast out devils. They're casting out these demons, right? Evil spirits out of people. And it's the devil working for, through them. Because we'll find out in a second here, right? And it says, in thy name done many wonderful works. What? People are doing many wonderful works in Jesus' name? But what does he say to them? Right? He says not everyone will en enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right, So this is not saying inherit the kingdom of heaven. He's saying not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, shall even enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? They're doing wonderful work, so they're baptizing. Uh, they're doing charity for you know feeding the poor. Uh, maybe they're doing miracles and healing people. They're doing wonderful works, many wonderful works, right? It says miraculous power. Might, strength, see? They're, they're healing people. They're doing something crazy, right? God has to be with them. But Jesus says, And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity or lawlessness. And this is connected to 
the lack of love because love is loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul and loving your fellow man as yourself. Iniqu you know, if you lose iniquity, you lose love. So they're not doing this out of love for God. They're not doing this out of love for their fellow man. There's a different spirit working in them, deceiving them to think that God is with them even though they do not have this love. Right? It's like a Judas. He was doing apostle-like miracles. But something else was working through him to deceive him to think that he was really with God. Right? Because they're prophesying in Jesus' name, casting out devils, and many miraculous works, miracles. But Jesus is like, I never even knew you. They don't even enter the kingdom of heaven. Everything we've read was about inheriting the kingdom of heaven. So these people are in the kingdom. They entered, but they don't inherit anything. This is saying these people who are doing these works don't even enter into the kingdom. This is crazy because it, it, we just read in Matthew chapter 5 that those who are teaching to don't keep the commandments and they don't bother to keep the commandments, that they still enter the kingdom of heaven because they're just considered the least of the kingdom of heaven. These people don't even get in. Isn't that crazy? And let's let's go about this iniquity here. Let's go to Matthew 24 real quick just to draw the connection. And... Uh, Right here at verse 12, it says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So you see, the lawlessness causes the love of many to grow cold. Right here. Verse 12, if you're trying to find it, let me highlight it here. And because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because the law is loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, just everything you got. Right? And loving your fellow man as yourself. And because iniquity, which is lawlessness, shall abound, love is gone too. Right? Whack. The love has grown cold. Now, I don't remember what this one was. Um, oh, yes, yes. Because I'm talking to Catholics here, so I figured I would read this in Matthew chapter 9. And it said, and it came to pass because, you know, I'm in the group with the people who, they don't want to obey God. They're sinners. They've accepted Jesus and some haven't. And, you know, the Pharisees, the modern day Catholics, there's one and the same right here, the Pharisees. It says here, and it came to pass as Jesus sat at me in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but the sick. And he's kind of mocking them here, because obviously they are sick, but they just don't realize it. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous but the sinners to repentance. Right? And repentance is calling the sinners to turn to God. I know they say turn away from sin. You, you can't turn away from sin. Everywhere you turn is sin. Repentance is to turn to God. All right? So... The righteous, oh, well, they're apparently they're already looking at God, right? They don't need a physician because they're not sick. They don't need to look at God because they're righteous, right? He's mocking them because they're going by their own righteousness, the works of the law, just like a Catholic. And he's like, no, well, I'm not here for you. You know, you're already righteous. I'm here to call the sinners to repentance. And the Pharisees would think that the Messiah is going to come. And he's going to be coming to the religious leaders, to them, because they're righteous. Why, he's, why would he go to the sinners? He's going to come and he's going to establish himself king. And he's going to be the king of Israel. And he's going to push out the Romans. The Catholics? Oh, you know, Jesus is going to come. He's going to sit on the Peter's throne. Now that's an Antichrist. That's a false messiah right there. And it's the same thing. A huge connection between Israel and the Roman Catholic Church. 
if you can learn a lot about the, how the Roman Catholic Church is by looking at the Old Testament and how Israel was. But uh, I could get in more detail of that, but that's that's it. I, I stopped it here. I think that's a sign to end it here. So anyway, uh, this was very informative. I learned a lot just kind of winging it here. I was just letting God guide me through this. It's pretty cool. Uh, so anyway, like I said, that is that. Thanks for watching and take care.